Taiwan. I'm Philip Assard with news from here in Taiwan and around the world. The U.S. owes Taiwan close to 20 billion U.S. dollars in military hardware. American lawmakers are now trying to shrink the backlog. As Leslie Liao reports, one bold proposal would allow U.S. weapons to be manufactured right here in Taiwan. Taiwan needs weapons to defend itself against threats from neighboring China. Beijing claims the country as part of its territory and has not ruled out an invasion to bring it under control. To bolster its military, Taiwan has been buying up billions of U.S. dollars worth of weapons from the United States. But Taiwan isn't getting the weapons it's purchased, and the backlog is now worth close to 20 billion U.S. dollars. What's the holdup? Supply chain issues, labor shortages, and shifting geopolitical priorities on the U.S. end. Now, a group of bipartisan U.S. lawmakers is proposing a bold new solution. Instead of waiting for arms deliveries from overseas, why not build U.S. weapons in Taiwan? Under the proposal, Taiwan would be licensed to build U.S. military hardware on its soil. But to pull off something like this comes with risks. China frequently carries out cyber attacks on Taiwan. If U.S. weapons are allowed to be built here, China could get its hands on U.S. intelligence. We've seen that in a hearing uh, last month, uh, the House of Representatives, uh, uh, Mr. Matt Gates, also questioned that whether Taiwan's uh, military has been infiltrated by the spies from China. The potential for intelligence leaks is something Taiwan's ruling politicians also acknowledge. And because of these intelligence risks, military analysts think that U.S. hardware production in Taiwan would be limited. China has made it clear it has its sights set on Taiwan. And with Taipei working to strengthen its military, the U.S.'s most recent proposal shows both countries are willing to get creative to make sure Taiwan has the defenses it needs in a worst-case scenario. Scott Huang and Leslie Liao for Taiwan Plus. China has opened new flight routes that pass near an unofficial boundary next to two of Taiwan's offshore islands. Tiffany Wong has more. Chinese flight paths will soon be moving closer to Taiwan than ever before. New flight paths from two coastal cities in China connect along the M503 route, close to what's known as the Median Line. It's an unofficial boundary that separates China and Taiwan in the strait between them. Taiwanese officials say the proposed flight paths could pose a threat for flights in the airspace of Taiwan's offshore islands like Jinmen and Mazu. Some officials say that the new Chinese flight paths could also be used as a way to test Taiwan's boundaries. China does not recognize the median line, and it frequently flies warplanes over it. Security analysts say adjusting civilian flight paths could be another strategy to pressure Taiwan. With Taiwan set to inaugurate a new president who sees Beijing as less than friendly next month, the country is likely to face growing pressure from China, including incursions in the air. Ryan Wu and Tiffany Wong for Taiwan Plus. It'll be more expensive for Taiwan to export some of its plastics to China now that Beijing has imposed a new raft of tariffs on polycarbonates. China's Commerce Ministry says cheap Taiwanese imports are harming its own domestic industry. Polycarbonate is a material used in electronics, automotives, optics, and medical devices. China is Taiwan's biggest export market for polycarbonates, accounting for nearly 80 percent of the total and worth around 830 million U.S. dollars. The tariffs are expected to last five years and come one month before the inauguration of President-elect Lai Qingde. North Korean state media say the country tested two types of missiles on Friday. 
The agency says that Pyongyang conducted a power test of a cruise missile warhead that's believed to be nuclear capable. It also says the North Korean military tested a new anti-aircraft missile. State media say the tests are part of their regular military operations and are unrelated to regional tensions. South Korea, Japan and the United States often report on such tests, but these countries made no mention of any detected activity. Shots were fired outside a voting booth in northeastern India as the country's elections got underway on Friday. The gunshots were heard in Manipur state, which has seen deadly ethnic clashes over the past year. One voter was injured. Angry residents later ransacked the voting station. Voting in India's general elections will take place in seven phases over six weeks. The Solomon Islands pro-China leader has retained his seat in just concluded elections. But it's still not known if his party has won enough support to form the next government or whether he can continue in power. During his term, Manasseh Sogavare broke diplomatic ties with Taiwan and signed a security deal with Beijing. That's worried some countries, including the United States and Australia. Full results for the 50-seat parliament are expected on Monday. Taiwan is aiming for net zero carbon emissions by 2050, but how will it achieve that goal? Well, Leslie Lau went to an annual net zero forum to find out what kind of green technologies the country could be adopting. A cleaner and more sustainable planet. Sound too good to be true? Maybe it isn't. More than 140 countries have pledged for net zero carbon emissions, meaning they'll offset the amount of carbon they emit into the atmosphere. Carbon emissions are directly related to climate change. Temperatures are rising at an alarming rate, with global heat records smashed monthly. Taiwan aims to be net zero by 2050, but for that to happen, it'll need help from all its industries and businesses. For the past three years, the Industrial Technology Research Institute, or ETRI, has hosted Net Zero Day, an annual forum to showcase the latest in industrial green technology. For uh, net zero sustainability, we, we have to focus on the technology development for sure. So a lot of things we, are, we have been doing for the past couple of years really focus on the new technology or mature technology uh, development and deployment. This year, ETRI is showcasing the potential of hydrogen power. Hydrogen has been under development for the past, I would say, 20, 30 years. Uh, unfortunately, economically cannot be justified, could not be justified. That's why the application was not that popular. But now because of the, the, the reduction, carbon reduction goal, so car, uh, hydrogen become uh, a hope. E-Tree hopes to use hydrogen as an alternative to traditional fossil fuels. That's because when burned, it doesn't generate carbon dioxide like coal or oil. Instead, it combines with oxygen atoms to become water while also releasing energy. Opponents of hydrogen power say that burning the gas still creates nitrogen oxide, which can be harmful to people. Nitrogen oxide is created when air is heated to high temperatures, so it's also produced when burning fossil fuels. Eitri says it's still testing their hydrogen technology for nitrogen oxide output. Net Zero Day isn't just about showing off technology. Eitri is also showing companies how to become a net zero business. This particular Net Zero Day today is our uh, consultation services. Now people look at the, the technology, people look at their, uh, what their pain points are, but they don't know how to do it. Or they don't know how to do from A to Z as a systematic view. So we provide a consultation team. Sustainability and economic development are often seen as being at odds with one another. But as this forum aims to show, if Taiwan's businesses can weather the growing pains and make the transition, net zero doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. Patrick Sun and Leslie Liao for Taiwan Plus. A southern Taiwan city is planning to put its waste to use by turning a sewage plant into the country's first hydroelectric power generator. Kaohsiung City wants to install turbines next to a tank used to disinfect wastewater. 
Engineers say the turbines could generate over 1 million kilowatt hours of energy per year, which could supply energy to around 100 households per day. Local energy officials hope to complete the project by the end of the year. Climate change is impacting weather patterns around Taiwan, and nobody is feeling the heat more than farmers whose crop yields are suffering. Reese Ayers has more. Bone dry down to the roots. These bamboo shoots aren't getting the moisture they need to grow. On the outskirts of Tainan in southern Taiwan, farmers are feeling the pinch as long spells of heat and drought starve their crops of the water they need to thrive. Extreme weather conditions, such as the record-breaking heat wave that hit Taiwan's south in late March, are becoming more common due to global warming. And it's impacting crop yields across the country. The agriculture industry is among the first to feel the impact of climate change, as year-on-year -year crop yields suffer, resulting in less and poorer quality produce. And it's not just bamboo shoots feeling the burn. And smaller yields mean higher prices for consumers, who could be digging deep to put food on the table this summer, as heat records continue to be broken the world over and more extreme weather becomes the norm. Klein Wang and Reese says for Taiwan Plus. At least 69 people have died in Pakistan as heavy rain continues to flood the country. Officials say recent rainfall has been almost twice the average amount for this time of year. Dozens of people have been injured by landslides, lightning strikes and collapsing buildings. With more rainfall and hail forecasts for the coming days, evacuated residents are struggling to cope with the damage. <laughs> An area in Taiwan's second largest city is getting a makeover by going back in time. Louise Watt reports on the young people who dedicated a decade to preserving some of what made Taichung City stand out. The area around Taichung City's railway station was once a flourishing economic hub. The crowds and businesses have trickled away, but now some of the young people in Taiwan's second largest city are trying to revive the vigor of its heyday. These young residents press the local government to preserve the area's cultural heritage as they redevelop areas of the city, such as these historic train tracks, which were meant to be torn up. These activists weren't even born when this area of Taichung was in its prime, but after 10 years of dedicated work, they've managed to bring back some of the sparkle it lost along the way. Eason Chen and Louise Watt. For Taiwan Plus. Thanks for joining us here on What's Up Taiwan. You can visit the Taiwan Plus website or follow our social media for more stories from Taiwan and around the world. Before we go, hold on to your hats for this footage of kite surfers competing in the 2024 GKA Kite World Tour in France. I'm Philip Rossard. Take care, and we'll see you next time.